As Americans in the 21st century, we are fortunate to live in a nation of natural beauty and abundance. We live in a country where we can readily visit national parks, reserves, and wilderness and see astounding natural scenery and wildlife. Our country is famous for the majestic elk, the grizzly, the bison, and the wolf. But not so long ago, in fact, just 100 years ago, the fate of our wildlife was in its most precarious state. Many species were on the brink of extinction, and if the status quo of that time continued, today there would be no bison, grizzly, wolf, elk, cranes, none at all. We would have hunted them to extinction. However, Americans rose to the challenge. Instead of extinction, we chose the path of conservation and the wise use of our natural resources. We took action. We stopped the unregulated use and saved our wildlife. It was a conscious, measured, and deliberate effort on the part of various citizens, such as naturalists, policymakers, and especially the hunters and anglers of the time. How could such a tide be turned? How could a country restore nearly extinct wildlife to the abundance for which we are now known? The story is an amazing tale of national history, a story that can serve as a reminder for what we can accomplish when working together with a common goal. In this case, the goal was to save our wildlife legacy. The story begins with the founding of our country. When colonists first settled here, they encountered an abundance of natural resources. Settlers quickly learned which trees made the best lumber, which fields made the best farmlands, and which wildlife was the best game. For many early settlers, unregulated hunting was a privilege they had never experienced. Back in Elizabethan England, game belonged to the landowners who were usually royalty, and only the wealthy participated in big game hunting. Commoners were reduced to taking small game from the minimally available public lands. Hunting wildlife was an important part of the settling of this land. Wild game was crucial to the survival of the early settlers. Deer, turkey, moose, elk, and small game were an important part of the early American diet. Hide for clothing was also important. At the time, game was abundant and the bounty seemed endless. In addition to being an important source of food, wildlife was also valued for its fur and feathers. Many Europeans saw the natural bounty of the American wilderness as a source of wealth, with the fur-bearing animals such as beaver, marten, fisher, and wolverine being abundant, free for the taking, and whose hides were profitable to sell. What started as an exchange between European traders and the Native Americans became, for a time, one of the most profitable and important industries in North America. Beaver pelts were considered not only a measure of wealth and currency, but the most important natural resource to come out of the New World. Demand for furs in Europe grew, and more and more trappers came to the New World to partake in this bounty. By the 1700s, beaver became increasingly scarce in eastern North America. Trappers moved west, exploring the wilderness and extracting an abundance of pelts from the western lands. With a strong belief in manifest destiny, or America's right and duty to expand across the continent, the settlers pressed westward. More and more land was cleared for settlements and agricultural fields. Forests were cut for fuel wood and lumber. This westward expansion increased the demand for game. Wildlife continued to be an important food source, and hunting was a way of life in this growing country. By the 1800s, however, animals such as deer, bison, pronghorn, elk, and beaver were becoming scarce in some places, primarily due to unregulated hunting and loss of habitat. First Transcontinental Railroad completed in 1869, not only brought new settlers, but provided easier access to western hunting grounds. The railroad also made the shipping of animal hides to the east more convenient and economical for market hunters. 
Up to this time, hunting was mostly unregulated and unrestricted. In the eastern United States, where some wildlife had become noticeably absent, the first hunting restrictions that reduced hunting seasons, or bag limits, were imposed. However, the West was still wide open to unregulated hunting. There were no bag limits, and hunters were free to take what they could shoot or trap. While some conscientiously self-regulated their hunting, taking only what they needed, others made a living from hunting. Market hunting, the shooting or capture of wildlife for sale to milliners, restaurants, or other markets, became big business during the mid to late 1800s. Not only were market hunters taking fur-bearing animals, but market hunting for birds also became popular and profitable for food, down, and fashion. The story of the demise of the American bison is well known to most Americans. Professional market hunters, responding largely to the demand for buffalo hides and meat, hunted the bison to near extinction in the late 19th century. Aided by the development of more efficient guns and the transportation opportunities provided by the railroad, unregulated hunting reduced the American bison herd from a population of at least 30 million to a few thousand. By the late 1800s, the American bison was on the brink of extinction. The slaughter of the southern herd was documented by William T. Hornaday, director of the New York Zoological Society. By 1889, the total number of bison running wild and unprotected was 600. 35. Added to that were 256 captive bison and 200 that were under government protection in Yellowstone National Park. According to Hornaday, the whole number of individuals of bison Americanus now living is 1,091. Bison were so scarce, hunting became unprofitable. However, herds in captivity and protected in Yellowstone slowly started growing. While most people know the story of the bison, few know that during the same era, other wildlife populations such as deer, elk, pronghorn, cougar, wolf, grizzly, turkey, and waterfowl were drastically declining. Habitat loss, market hunting, and predator eradication all contributed to the decline. In the eastern waterways and wetlands, waterfowl were being decimated by market hunters, with some species very near extinction. In the words of William T. Hornaday, of all the meat shooters, the market gunners who prey on wildfowl and ground game birds for the big city markets are the most deadly to wildlife. In an attempt to kill as many birds as possible in the shortest amount of time and with the least effort, market hunters employed a variety of techniques and weapons. To aid in the slaughter, gun technology advanced to ensure more take with fewer shots. The punt gun was a modified shotgun used by market hunters to kill waterfowl. It was mounted on a small boat and could shoot up to 100 birds in a single shot. Waterfowl are migratory birds and many species come from various breeding grounds in the north to only a few bays along the eastern seaboard to overwinter. These bays and marshes would harbor thousands and thousands of wild ducks, geese, and other waterfowl. These wintering grounds became a shooting ground for market hunters. In any market-driven situation, one cannot place all the blame on the supplier. Those in demand of the game meat were equally at fault. Game meat, furs, and especially ornamental bird feathers were all in great demand and very fashionable at the time. In addition to improved gun technology, developments in cold storage aided market hunters' endeavors. The number of wild birds taken by market hunters for food and fashion was driving some species to near extinction.
When William T. Hornaday published his seminal book, Our Vanishing Wildlife, in 1913, some wildlife species had already been exploited to extinction or near extinction due to unregulated hunting. North American birds that were already or nearly extinct included the great auk, the Carolina parakeet, and the passenger pigeon. In addition to the loss of birds, several species of large mammals were in danger. Numbers of elk, deer, pronghorn, grizzly, and wolves were drastically declining. An entire subspecies of elk, called Miriam's elk, which occurred in the southwest, was eradicated before it could even be scientifically described. The last Miriam's elk was killed in Arizona around 1900. It was wildlife's darkest hour. Something had to be done to stop the complete annihilation of America's wildlife. As the alarm cry was sounded, Americans listened. The vanishing wildlife was too evident not to notice. Sportsmen, scientists, politicians, naturalists, and many citizens all knew that something must be done. Even the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, himself an avid hunter, recognized the problem. The professional market hunter who kills game and the rich people who are content to buy what they have not the skill to get by their own exertions, these are the men who are the real enemies of game. It was time to turn the tides and save our vanishing wildlife. But who would do it? What? <laughs>